Let's talk about the debt ceiling uh, problem. And let me ask that question again. How bad is that? Well, it, it, if, if, if it really, if, if it goes on a few days, I mean, if, if we really uh, don't get it resolved in a day or two, it's, it's absolutely terrible. I mean, I, I've told my children that it takes 20 years to build a reputation and it takes 20 minutes to ruin it. And we Five have, minutes. Pardon me? Five minutes. Well, Five yeah, minutes. With particularly some of my kids. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, but we have spent 237 years since 1776 building a reputation, uh, you know, as the most wonderful country in, on earth, and one that's entrusted with having the reserve currency of the world, the one who, when they say full faith and credit, nobody questions it. And that could, well, that is being put in jeopardy now, and it could be, it could be destroyed in a little while. And, and, a, and a great reputation, as I say, is, is like virginity. It can, be re, it can be preserved, but it can't be restored. And, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, at least that's what my dad told me. <laughs> the, uh, so it, 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 is, it, is, it is absolute folly to uh, even think about it, and it will be, I mean, I, I don't know what the words are to describe it if, if we actually would default. Uh, I can't believe it'll be done because uh, it just is so stupid, and I think that the whole idea of a of a debt limit is a terrible, terrible mistake. I mean, if you're going to spend more than you take in, what are you going to do except raise the debt limit? So it becomes this political weapon of mass destruction. It really is like a nuclear bomb. It's something maybe you can talk about, it, but you can't even dream of using it. We, we dropped two atom bombs in 1945. We've never done it since. Now, we've been frustrated by all kinds of government. We, we, we had a war in Vietnam that we were, you know, we did not get a satisfactory resolution to it. We've had other wars, but we didn't think about we were going to drop nuclear bombs. I mean, there, there are certain things that just don't, should not be used in a, in, a, in a civilization. And the idea of breaking the government's promises to achieve any other end, whether it's gun control, abortion, Obamacare, whatever it is, tying it to that is, is, is madness. You can argue those other things out, but leave, get the debt ceiling out of the picture. Well, and here we are, um, uh, two days away from uh, the supposed, um, well, it is, the actual um, uh, moment at which uh, we do not raise it or do raise it. Um, and do you have a kind of scenario in mind as, how, as to how we will get from here to actually solving this problem? Well, I think the way to solve it is just to say the debt ceiling, both parties to say the debt ceiling will never be used as a weapon of mass destruction. It's off the table. We'll argue about all kinds of other things and, and see how they come out, but we are not going to say, we are not going to threaten the world and our own citizens with the fact that we aren't going to make good on our promises to achieve some other end. It, 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 it doesn't make any sense. Well, and, and seeing the political climate in Washington, can you imagine that happening in the next couple of days? I, I can't imagine that the full thing playing out that way, although I wish it would. But maybe it will have, maybe this has been the demonstration project we needed. I mean, uh, you know, we, it, uh, we didn't know exactly what atomic weapons could do until we did them. And, and, and then it was an important, it was an incredible goal, obviously, at the time. But we decided we didn't want to do that again, no matter how serious things got. And, and uh, uh, I, I hope that comes out of it. But I think that what, w I think basically, it, uh, you know, you, you really need to, House Republicans to, to say, oh, you know, this is a weapon we shouldn't have used, and we'll, we think Obamacare, Obamacare is terrible, and, you know, we'll fight it out, and we'll beat you in 2014 in the elections and prove it, and so on. But, but we, will not, we will not say that the United States is going to make its promises to millions and millions of citizens in other countries and everything, just because we're not getting our way. And how about the prospect that it will just be pushed forward uh, to the end of January or something? That, that seems to be our specialty. I mean, we've gotten good at that. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we don't know how to solve problems, but we sure know how to postpone them. <laughs> and uh, that may be what happens. I'll be disappointed if it does, but, but, but it I, may. I think all of us will just hate to go through this. Well, it's ridiculous. I, and, I mean, why, why, why do it? I mean, you know, it, it, uh, no, I... It, uh, if, if you have a problem, you face it, you know, and, and, but, and, and the debt ceiling is a problem that we can get rid of it being a problem. Then we'll have a lot of other problems, and we can fight those out on their own turf. But, 
to just push it down the road. I mean, you know, the people go through Christmas wondering you know, how's all this all gonna come out and they pay up point a super committee, which turns out to be a mini committee and all kinds of things. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, the debt ceiling, I know, is a big concern for you. Um, yesterday, you said something to the effect that, you know, we're not going to get a reasonable solution when you've got a gun to your head. Um, what if we don't get a deal, Warren? What happens? Well, nobody knows, and that's why it's a crazy. I mean, what, what, you, do, what you do, if you don't get a deal, you are putting a gun to your head, and you're saying this this cylinder has six chambers, and there's we're going to stick a bullet in one and spin it, and and, and pull the trigger and see what happens. Nothing may happen. Nobody knows. We have, we have, you know, we don't have a, we don't have a parallel for it in the past. But it's crazy. I mean, uh, which would you rather have borrowing in the markets five years from now? A, a, a U.S. government that's that's interrupted payments because of a squabble, you know, within its Congress. You know, 535 people that couldn't get together when they knew for months that something was coming up that was important. Or would you rather lend to somebody that promptly? does what's necessary. But you, you, you could say um, that, you know, it is the United States. What other alternative do you have, though, to put your... Oh, I don't... I, yeah, the United States is... We're a very special place. There's no question about it. And and we will pay our debts in the end. So it, it is not like if we don't pay, we can't pay. We've got the right to print our own money. That's the key. <laughs> Greece lost the power to print their money. If they could print drachmas, they would not have... <laughs> they, you know, they'd have other problems. Right. But they would not have a debt problem. And And... 17 countries in Europe gave up the right to print their own money. That's enormously important, and, and we've got the right to print our own money, so okay. our credit's good. This question comes from Eric Weissman, who asks, are you worried about Congress playing politics with the raising of the debt ceiling? What would this do to Berkshire Hathaway stock and to the overall economy? You mean if they didn't raise it? If uh, they didn't raise yeah. it. Yeah, right. well, it, it would probably... Uh, be the most asinine, you know, act that Congress, which uh, ever performed. That one time in Indiana, back in the 1890s, I think they passed a bill. I know it was introduced. Uh, you can look it up on a search engine. Uh, they passed a bill to change the value of pi, the mathematical term pi, to an even three, because they said it would be easier for the school children to work with. Well. <laughs> That's the only bill I can think of that would give competition <laughs> to a refusal to raise the debt ceiling. I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, it really is extraordinary that with our deficit running, you know, well over $100 billion a month uh, and all kinds of items that can be changed. I mean, there's having a debt ceiling to start with is, is a mistake. I mean, it doesn't, the United States of, of 2011 has a different debt capacity than the, the United States of 1911. And it, we're always, it's going to be a growing country and we're going to have a growing debt capacity. That doesn't mean I think it's a great idea at all to have debt growing as a percentage of GDP, but to stick debt ceilings on so that these games get played and all the time that gets wasted and everything and, and, and the, you know, the amount of number of silly statements that you hear and it just it just seems such a waste of time for a country that's got a lot of things to do uh, but in the end they won't in my view there's no chance that they uh, don't increase the debt ceiling and I would love to see them you know like well I'd love to see them eliminate the idea because it just it results in these periodic uh, kind of stalemate operations where everybody uses it for posturing purposes and everything of the sort. But uh, it, the United States is not going to have a debt crisis uh, of any kind as long as we keep issuing our notes in our own currency. You know, the, uh, the difference between being able to borrow in your own currency and having to borrow in another currency is night and day. The only thing we have to worry about is the printing press and inflation. And if you're a member of the Euro, European Monetary Union, you have to worry about, you can't print money. You can, uh, you can go and get your coal members to try and help you out. But giving up the right to issue debt in your own currency is a huge step. And the United States 
has not done it. I don't know whether we've ever issued U.S. bonds in any other currency, but we certainly haven't made a habit of it. And the Japanese, incidentally, which have a very high ratio of debt to GDP, also have consistently borrowed in their own currency. And uh, believe me, when it's time to pay somebody back and you have a choice of paying and, and you're forced to pay in somebody else's currency uh, versus paying in your, in your own, uh, it's, it's an entirely different proposition. Matter of fact, Charlie and I, we, we were trying to buy that bank back in Chicago. Yeah, in Chicago in the late 1960s. And this was a time of really tight money, and tight money was different then than tight money is today. I mean, it, 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 uh, tight money meant no money. And somebody, we wanted to buy this bank, and they wanted, uh, the only place we could find some money, I think, was in Kuwait and Dinars, wasn't it? Yeah, in Kuwait and Dinars. Yeah. And I thought to myself, and Charlie concurred, you know, who the hell knew? what they were going to say the value of the dinar was when we went to pay it back. <laughs> I mean, it was not something over which we had a lot of control. So we decided not to borrow the money in dinars, so even though I kind of wish we'd bought the bank. But, um, Charlie, have you got anything to say on that? No. <laughs> I do think, I do think, you know, I remember an era when we had a bipartisan foreign policy and all that, and I liked that era. And that was the Marshall Plan, and a lot of wonderful, constructive things were done. And uh, they were generous things. Now, now it seems to me that both parties are trying to compete to see who can be the most stupid. <laughs> and they keep topping one another. Now. <laughs> now, before I get into Howard Marks' um, take on the U.S. debt crisis, I want to play here something from... Michael Milken and Howard Marks on sovereign debt. Uh, there was a book written this time, it's different, and it really related to sovereign debt and credit. And so I'm at Berkeley in 65 studying credit and almost all sovereign debt is rated AAA. And it's considered the least risky debt of all. And the head of the Federal Reserve, uh, Paul Volcker, in the 70s, is telling everyone that no country ever defaulted, ever went bankrupt. Yet it has absolutely nothing to do with history. And I think I want to just underline this point uh, that Howard has made here. When you step back in history, ask yourself, ha have you done the original research? What is common wisdom? You know, as I listened to Paul uh, Volcker in that period of time, uh, Chairman Volcker, talk, and uh, the speech I remember most, uh, Howard, was one in the, around 80 or 81, that Poland is not international harvester. Both Poland and international harvester were trading at 31 cents on the dollar. And his point was, Poland is a country, countries don't default. Uh, don't go bankrupt. And of course, International Harvester could go bankrupt. Well, he was right, but he was wrong. International Harvester paid you off 100 cents on the dollar, never missed an interest payment, and Poland reorganized its debt in the 30s. So for every dollar of debt, you got 30 cents of well, He was right semantically, he was just not right financially. Right? Correct. Yeah. And so I just want to stress um, the importance of research. So I want to talk about the current debt environment a little bit and just get your thoughts. Global debt is around nearly 350% of global GDP. And similar to how high rates can negatively affect corporate debt and how zombie companies who spend more than they earn have sustained through this low interest rate environment uh, and they may be facing a reckoning, our country, along with the rest of the world, has continued to accumulate debt and there's now a non-zero chance that our country could default on its debt. What are your general thoughts on how this new moderate interest rate environment will impact our country and its overall place in the world? You know, uh, late 2020, not so long ago, when it looked like we were getting out of the pandemic and the related economic malaise uh, unscathed, 
stock market was high, interest rates were low, inflation was quiescent, uh, people started talking about something called the modern monetary theory and the belief that you could run as big a deficit as you like and take on as much debt as you like um, with no negative consequences as long as, quote, you're in control of your currency. And uh, that seemed to me, uh, what I said at the time was that it seems too good to be true. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know why it's too good to be true, but I think it's too good to be true. And, uh, you know, it's like, it would be like if somebody said, well, I'll give you a credit card and it has no uh, maximum balance and it has no uh, it, it requirement to ever repay principal. Oh, God, if, if you have one of those, you can buy anything you want. And you don't never have to go out of pocket, although maybe you do for the interest, but maybe you can put the interest on the credit card. And it's the same thing. It, it's the way our country is being run. Uh, now, if. If, if somebody offered me that credit card, or you, Trey, the first thing you would say is, well, what's the catch? And when, when they say it about our country, I say, what's the catch? I think there must be a catch, but I, I just don't know what it is. So let's say we're at 350% of GDP. Is that too much? No one can say, you know? Uh, I mean, we were very high uh, at the end of 20, the debt to GDP. Uh, but nothing bad seemed to be happening. Uh, at the end of, uh, uh, or mid-22, we concluded that the inflation was too high and was not going to be transitory. So now we conclude that the debt is too high. So it, what's, this, what's the line in the sand where it, go, where it becomes excessive? No one can say. Uh, Japan's had heavy debt for a long time. It's conser- thought of it as a conservative country but they may do. Um, uh, uh, other countries that we think are, uh, uh, you know, less stellar than we are have higher debt ratios and they seem to do okay. It's really very hard to, to, to come up, I think, with, with the statement of this is, too, this is okay and that's too much. Uh, I think we just have to avoid having that thinking. You know, I mean, one of the great... <laughs> helpful things in life is to, is is the, if it sounds too good to be true it probably is and i just think it's too good to be true to think we can have a credit card we never have to pay the balance on mr buffett and mr munger hi. hi my name is daphne i'm 13 years old and this is my sixth annual berkshire halfway chain shoulders meeting and I've had the privilege to ask you both questions in years past. My question for you today is the following. As you know, the U.S. national debt is currently at an estimated $31 trillion, making up about 125% of the U.S. GDP. In the meantime, over the past few years, the Federal Reserve has telegraphed that they intend to monetize the debt by printing trillions of dollars, even as they insist that they're fighting inflation. Already, other major economies in the world, such as China, Saudi Arabia, and Brazil, are moving away from the dollar in anticipation of this. My question is, are we likely to face a time in the future when the US dollar is no longer the global reserve currency? How is Berkshire prepared for this possibility? And what can we do as American citizens to attempt to shelter ourselves from what's beginning to look like the beginnings of de-dollarization. Well, I I should ask you to come up here and answer some questions. I mean, (laughs) uh, it's very interesting. I mean, we are the reserve currency. I see no option for any other currency to be the reserve currency. And, and, uh, uh, I think that nobody understands the situation better than Jay Powell. And, uh, uh, I, but he's not in control of, of fiscal policy. And every now and then he drops a few hints. Uh, and there was no question that, that when the, uh, when, 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 when the in pandemic broke out, I mean, it was a semi warlike situation, but, Nobody knows 
how far you can go with the paper currency before it gets out of control. If, and particularly if you're the reserve, world's reserve currency. Nobody knows the answer to that. And you don't want to try and pick out the point of where it does become a problem because then it's all over. Uh, and uh, I think we should be very careful. I mean, you know, we all learned Keynesianism and we applied it in World War II to the advantage of the country. And, and we did everything we could, we could to prevent inflation during the war. And then the war ended in August of 45. And I think in January 46, and I'm not giving you exact figures at all now, but in January 46, I think the rate of inflation was at, at you know, something like 1% or thereabouts. And by the end of the year, I think it was at like 15%. And again, I'm doing this from long memories. But, but it's, it's easy for America to do its, a lot. But if we do too much... It's very hard to see how you recover once you let the genie out of the bottle and people lose faith in the currency. And they behave in an entirely different manner than they do when they feel that if they put some money in the bank or have a pension plan or whatever it may be, that they're going to get out something with roughly equal purchasing power. And it just changes the economy, and all kinds of things can happen then. And I can't predict them, and nobody else can predict them, but I do know they aren't good. And uh, we will see. And I, I, I do this as, my, my, you know, I, I, I voted for both parties, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not limited to politicians of either party or anything of the sort. Uh, uh, people take positions. Some of them understand what they're doing. Some of them don't understand what they're doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they put me on some medical board, I don't understand what I'm doing. You know, I, I, it's not that there's nothing wrong with the fact that you, that you can't master everything. You can, we can't all be Isaac Newton, but, but you can't go around pretending you do or making decisions on it. And, and we, are not as well off in relation to curbing inflation expectations, which become self-fulfilling, uh, and we are not as well off as we were earlier. And Berkshire is better prepared than most investments for that kind of a period. But I said this in the annual report, but we aren't perfectly prepared because there's no, there's no way to perfectly prepare. You don't know what course of action will occur. And... Uh, it's a very political decision now. It's a tribal decision to some degree. Uh, and uh, you hope for leadership that, that uh, actually will do something, recognizes the problem. And America is an incredible society, rich. You know, every, we got everything going for us, but that doesn't mean we can just print money indefinitely. But, uh, uh, as, as, as that, and uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it turns out. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to smash the like button and to subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much.